Welcome. And in this session, we're going to be reading Mark chapter 4. We're going to be talking about a lot of parables in this chapter. The parable of the sower, the parable of the lamp, the parable of the seed, and Jesus calms the storm. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Again, he began to teach by the seaside, speaking of Jesus. A great multitude, a lot of people, was gathered to him so that he entered into a boat in the sea and sat down. All the multitude were on the land by the sea. He taught them many things in parables and told them in his teaching. Listen, behold, the farmer went out to sow. As he sowed, some some seed fell by the road, and the birds Uh, in the Textus Receptus, says the birds of the air, came and devoured it. Others fell on rocky ground, where it had little soil, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of soil. When the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Those very aggressive thorns, forceful thorns, weren't they? Verse 8, others fell in the good ground and yielded fruit, growing up and increasing. Some produced 30 times, some 60 times, and some 100 times as much. He said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, those who were around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. He said to them, To you is given the mystery of God's kingdom, but to to those who are outside, all things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn again and their sin should be forgiven them. This is Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Let me just back up here just a second. Verse 11. To you is given the king, uh, God's kingdom. Okay? So he's talking to the people, the believers, the ones who have a little bit of this extra spiritual revelation, extra spiritual you know, fiber in their being. Okay? They know the, the mystery of God's kingdom. Okay, they know how God's kingdom operates. But to those who are outside, Jesus said, all things are done in parables. Now, this shows you how important it is to Jesus to teach the things of God to all people, to those who are on the inside, the ones who are in the inner circle, and to those who are on the outside. Okay, to those who are included and those who are on the outside. So he went above and beyond just to tell people, just to teach them the things about God's kingdom, the things about how God operates, how God rules this universe, and how God rules his kingdom. So he went above and beyond just telling them plainly. He, went, he told them in parables to try to make it as easy as possible to understand. Verse 12, it says here again that seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand. So that they have ears to hear, but they don't really hear. They have eyes to see, but they don't really perceive. They don't really understand. They don't really see it. Lest they should turn again, okay? Let's make shuva. This is repentance, okay? This is the primary focus of the whole thing. To turn and their sins should be forgiven them. Again, I always said this, uh, I'll say it again. In order for it to receive forgiveness, don't really expect to receive forgiveness without repentance first. You should repent of your sins as much as you can, as much as possible first. First comes repentance, then comes salvation. Or first comes repentance and then comes forgiveness. As it says in the Proverbs, that those who forsake their sin will find mercy. 
So this, the whole primary purpose, the whole primary, the, the moral of the story here, and the bottom line is to repent. Okay? Verse 13. And again, uh, those who are new to watching my videos here, to repent is not to feel sorry. It's not to cry your eyes out because you've done something wrong. It's to change. It's to turn. It's actually to do something that is, um, you know, to actually change your life, to turn. That's what God wants. He doesn't want just, oh, sorry, and then go and do it again. I'm sorry, don't. You know, he's looking for change. He's looking for you to turn, to change things around, to change the way you think, to change the way you live, to turn back to him. Verse 13, he said to them, don't you understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? Verse 14, the farmer sows the word. Okay, so this is talking about the farmer is the, like the preacher, right? Sows the word. The ones by the road are the ones where the, where the, excuse me, where the word is sown. When they have heard, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. These, in the same way, are those who are sown, uh, those who are sown on the rocky places, who, when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with joy. So, oh, you're, you know, you're reading the scriptures. Oh, yes, the scriptures, the Bible, the words in red, Jesus. Oh, yeah, I receive it with joy. Yeah, I believe in all that. But, but it says here, they have no root in themselves. They're short-lived, okay? When oppression or persecution arises because of, because of the word, immediately they will stumble. They'll fall away. They'll sin, okay? Let's make it clear here. The book of Acts says that you will enter into God's kingdom through persecution, through, through much persecution, Okay? It says also, Paul said in his writings, the Apostle Paul said, those who live godly will suffer persecution. Your friends will reject you. You, you might have trouble with family members. You have trouble with the people at work. On and on and on and on it goes. And, and, and even more so than that, okay? I mean, look at all the disciples. They actually died. They were brutally killed because of of their beliefs and their message. All of them except for John, you know, including Jesus himself. Verse 17, they have no root in themselves, but they are short-lived. When oppression or persecution arises because of the word, they, they stumble. Okay. Verse 18, others are those who are sown among the thorns. These are those who have heard the word and the cares of this age and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things enter in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Look at this. The cares of the age, okay? There's the cares of life, okay? The deceitfulness of riches. And this is a big thing. You know, how many people, especially in the developed countries uh, today in, this, in, in today's world, you have it so good, you have it so easy, have so much, so blessed compared to, you know, a thousand years ago or so. I mean, you have it so blessed. You have electricity, you have running water, you, a lot of things that are just so easy in, 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 in life. And a lot of things you just take for granted. The deceitfulness of riches. Yes, those riches, if you are not careful, most people who have those riches are deceived, okay? The riches are deceitful. They make you feel like you're comfortable. They make you feel comfortable. Make, make, make you believe that everything's okay. Make you believe that maybe that you don't need God all that much. Oh, yeah. But when you're on your deathbed, when you realize that all of those riches are just temporary and they mean nothing, Things changed a little bit. Look what happened in the states. You know, when the when the states were, was attacked, and and uh, you know, in two thousand one, right? 
And uh, it says that all, the church attendance was up, drastically up, for just a matter of, what, weeks? Maybe one week, maybe a few months, and that was that drop back down. The deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. Okay. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes, just things that look so beautiful, but really, in all honesty, is just trash. Okay, Lust of the flesh. That includes money, material things, cars, homes, toys, whatever you got, <laughs> anything. That includes sexual lust. That includes also food. Okay? When Jesus was tempted to eat the, you know, to make bread, to eat, because he was so hungry. That was tempting that area. It was tempting the area of the lust of the flesh. We know there's three, according to John and according to Genesis. Uh, three areas of sin, three ca three main categories of sin. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. And every one of those three areas were tempted. Uh, in Eve was tempted with every one of those. It says that she saw that the, f the fruit was good for food, lust of the flesh. Pleasing to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And desirable to make one wise according to world standard, of course, the worldly wisdom, of course, and that is the pride of life. Think you know everything? Be humble, you could be wrong. The thorns are the cares of this age, the deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things. They choke the word, choke the word of God, choke God's word for you and it becomes unfruitful. Those which were sown, those are the seeds, that is, which were sown on good ground are those who hear the word, hear it, accept the word, don't get offended, and bear fruit. Do things. Do something. Shine your light. Do something. Some 30 times, some 60 times, and some 100 times. Verse 21, he said to them, is the lamp brought to be put under a basket? Now it says here, literally a modian, a dry measuring basket containing about a peck or about nine liters. That's what he's talking about. Is the lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it put on a stand? For there is nothing hidden except that it should be made known. This is what you should highlight in your Bible. This is what you should highlight. This is the thing that most hypocrites forget, overlook, ignore. There's nothing hidden, Jesus said, that will not be made known. For there's nothing hidden except that it should be made known. Neither was anything made secret, but that it should come to light. If a man has ears to hear, let him hear. Everything, every one of your secrets, every secret thing, everything you do in the secret will at one point in time come to light. You try to make people think you're tougher than you are. You try to make people think you're more righteous than you are. You try to make people think that you're more moral than you are. The day is coming when God, by his moral standard, which is a whole lot different than people's moral standards today, by God's moral standard, as written in the scriptures, will shine and will expose everything. Okay? He will bring everything out. There's nothing hidden that will not be made known. Verse 24, And he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With whatever measure you measure, it will be measured back to you. It will be measured to you. With whatever measure you measure, it will be measured to you. And more will be given to you who hear. For whoever has, to him will be given. And he who doesn't have, 
even what he ha- even that which he has will be taken away from him. So in God's kingdom, it's either you're the richest of riches or, the, or you're the poorest of poorest, and that's just the way it is. There's no, there's no middle class in God's kingdom. Verse 26. He said, God's kingdom is as if a man should cast seed on the earth and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, though he doesn't know how. Even today, I think the scientists don't really understand the the real spark of life. Um, I've spoken to specialist doctors before about how do you know for sure where the cutoff point is when, when a person actually dies. And honestly, a lot of them can't really draw a clear line. They can't. They say, well, if you don't have a heart rate, maybe if you don't have a heart rate, the heart's still beating, it's just un- undetectable. Well, if there's no brain activity, well, yeah. But then again, you got those who are brain dead, so to speak. I mean, really, science does not really understand the essence of life. You can't just put it through a calculator and say, oh, yeah, this is, this, this is life and this is not life. I mean, obviously, if a person hasn't been breathing for a long time or, you know, for a considerable amount of time, you, you know, there you go. But I'm talking about within seconds. Can you actually draw the line within seconds? As of the filming of this video, as of the making of this uh, this teaching here, and I do not expect it to ever really be true that a scientist would ever really actually know what the essence of life really, really is. Okay. Sure, if someone doesn't have vital signs for, you know, 20 minutes, yeah, pronounce them as dead, but you know what I'm talking about. Verse 28. The, for the earth bears fruit by itself, first the blade, then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. But when the fruit is ripe, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Verse 30. He said, How will we liken God's kingdom? Or with what parable will we illustrate it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, though it is less than all the seeds that are on the earth, yet, when it is sown, grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and puts out great branches so that the birds of the sky can lodge under its shadow said this before in the parable of the uh, mustard seed uh, from the book of Matthew that I that I did not too long ago. Uh, you can check the video out if you haven't checked it out yet. But I said before that um, one, uh, one problem with a lot of conservative evangelical Christians today and even, you know, some Christians today, they take the scriptures sometimes too legalistically what i mean by that is they they dissect every single word and sometimes you can do that like you can do that when it comes to again you got to look at what are you reading who's the author with what authority are they writing you know when you're reading the torah i mean that's that's the most authoritative book you know in in jewish thought because we're talking about jewish people who wrote jewish book Every author of the book of the Bible, of the Bible, of the books of the Bible are Jews. Okay. So why not ask them how to, you know, how, how to read it, how to read what it says. I know a lot of Jews don't understand the, the correct interpretation of it. That's, that's a different story. But you got to ask, not every, not every author has this, has the same authority. Okay, Moses didn't have the same authority as, say, for example, uh, Paul. Okay, Paul doesn't have the same authority as Moses. Okay, Paul and Moses are two totally different people. The books of Moses 
the words of Moses and the ministry of Moses came with much more power, much more. Like it says, uh, God said, I speak to Moses face to face, not so with the prophets. With the prophets, I speak to them in dark parables and dark sayings and in this kind of stuff. And like Paul said, Paul admit, admitted in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that he, see th- he sees things through dark glass. That's not the way Moses did. Moses talked to God face to face. Moses had a very, a, a, a much more clearer intimate relationship with God than Paul did. So the words in the books of Moses carry much more weight than that of Paul, right? The books of Peter, James, and John uh, have carry more weight than other books from other different apostles or even Paul himself because Peter, James, and John were closer to the Lord, much closer to the Lord. They knew the Lord a lot better than the other nine apostles and and. Uh, Obviously, everybody else that was outside of the 12, including Paul. So you got to ask yourself a question. Um, when you're reading a scripture, who is writing, who wrote this, what, you, what, what, what you're just reading? Who wrote it? With what authority? Did they, did they write it? You know, I've, I've read uh, different things against uh, some of the books of the Apocrypha, and they said, well, the Apocrypha doesn't claim to be inspired of God. Well, there's a lot of other books that are included in your canonized Bible that doesn't claim explicitly to be the, 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 the Word of God. You know, again, the books of Moses, a lot of it does say, thus saith the Lord, right? Uh, whereas, let's say, for example, Paul, one of Paul's books, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm not, I'm not really, uh, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not dissing Paul. I mean, take it for what it is, okay? Um, but he said himself, you know, in that one, in his, at least in that one area, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, what I say is, is me, not God speaking right now, okay? What I'm saying is my word, in my opinion, it's not God's commandment. I don't have a commandment concerning this. I'm giving you my word, my ideas about this. Okay, so you got to look at things the way they really are. Um, in the days of Jesus, every book of the Bible was kept separately. They, they didn't have a Bible. They didn't compile a Bible uh, all together and say uh, put all the books together into one book and, and say this is the Bible. No, they didn't have that back then. And Jesus had no problem with it being all separated. Over here is the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah. Over here is the scroll of Jeremiah. Over here is the Psalms. Oh, behind we behind us we got the Torah scroll. Jesus had no problem with that. That gives it a little bit more of an in, an idea of the individuality of all the books. The only the only pro is pros and cons to everything you know, but the only pro to having it all thrown together in 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 compiled in one book called the Bible is convenience. It's all there in one book. The con is, is it makes it look like it's really one book, but it's not. It looks like it's all on the same level, so to speak, but it's not. You need to see the individuality of each book. Isaiah was written at this time in this culture, whereas Hosea was written at that time at that culture by a different author, where the books of Moses was written at this time in this culture by a different author as well. And different authors, different levels of authority. Okay. Uh, some of the authors were prophets, and some of them didn't even claim to be prophets, okay? Maybe they were just an apostle, or maybe they were just a scribe that wrote it, okay? So, it says here, Jesus said, though the mustard seed is less than all the seeds, and in some uh, in some versions of the bible it says the mustard seed is le- the, the the word less than all the seeds is like smaller than all the seeds smaller than all the seeds that are on the earth or less than all the seeds that are on the earth um i had a friend of mine and i said this in my other video in, in the book of matthew that i worked with um and he we worked at a, a food processing factory we worked with uh, different kind of herbs and this one herb that we worked with was actually a mustard seed that went into one of the products. A full, full grain mustard seed, okay, full size mustard seed. I knew it was mustard seed. And so I said this to my, you know, Christian friend. I said, you know, this is mustard seed, you know, this is what Jesus was talking about. He's like, no, it's not. I said, yeah, it's mustard seed. He said, no, it's not. This is, this is a fairly good sized seed compared to some of the other seeds. I mean, he was a gardener. 
he knew the size of different seeds. He said, this is a fairly good sized seed compared to other seeds. And Jesus said the mustard seed is the finest of all. It's the less, it's the least of all the seeds. It's, it's the less, it's, it's the smallest seed in all the earth. I'm like, don't take it like so legalistically literal. Don't dissect every single word that Jesus said. Look at it as a generality, what he was saying. Generally speaking, the mustard seed is very small. One of the smallest, I mean, to say it more, I guess you, if you want to say it, how can you say it more accurate, accurately than the Lord said it? But I mean, you know what I mean? Like to say it in today's language, uh, in today's more, pick, you know, people like to pick apart your words, right? So to say it in today's language, you might say the mustard seed is one of the smaller seeds, well, one of the smallest seeds in the earth, okay? Um, but this guy adamantly refused to believe that what, I, what, I showed, what we were working with was mustard seeds because he knew it wasn't the smallest seed in the earth because he took this literally, legalistically, Instead of looking at it as Jesus spoke as a generality, okay? This is the thing, this is the thing too, when Jesus talks about, let's say, you know, uh, the world, right? God so loved the world, okay? Generally speaking, not every single person. Because he also says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And obviously, Jesus didn't love those hypocrites. <laughs> We're going to read about it here. Jesus didn't love the hypocrites and the sinners, the real sinners, the hypocrites, very much. He called them sons of Satan, sons of hell, sons of uh, vipers, brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs. You look good on the in outside, but on the inside, you're full of stinking, filthy, dead, rotten flesh. And on and on and on it goes. I mean, he called a woman a dog. He refused to heal her. He, uh, I mean, lots of other things that went, ha went on. Okay. So if God so loved, the Jesus said, I don't pray for the world, Father. If God loved every single person in the world, like how some people believe, well, God is love. Well, God, love doesn't love darkness. Some people are not light. God is light too. God is light. Light does not love darkness. Darkness does not love light. God is judge. He's judge too. You know, your definition of love, sinner, might be a whole lot different, is a whole lot different than God's definition of love, okay? His definition of love is you obey me. And you fear, and you shake, and you tremble at my word. You're humble. No, no pride whatsoever. It says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's what the scriptures say. That is what the Bible says. Yes. The most they say it's the best-selling book in all of history, the Bible. So yes, Jesus said, though it is less than all the seeds that are on the earth, when it is grown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs. Again, if you know the mustard plant, you know the mustard plant is not the greatest of all the herbs, and neither it's the smallest of all the seeds. But generally speaking, Jesus is talking about generally. Yes, it's a very small seed. Yes, it produces a big, big plant. So this is the way that the um, kingdom of heaven is. Uh, you take faith, which is a very small seed. It produces a very big uh, result. Verse 33. With many such parables, he spoke to them as they were able to hear it. Without a parable, he didn't speak to them, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Verse 35, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the multitude, they took with them even as, as, as he was in the boat. Other boats were also with him. A big windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so much that the boat was already filled. He himself was in the stern asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and, and told him, Teacher, Rabbi, don't you care that we are dying? Jesus is not concerned about anything here, is he? I mean, he's in the middle of a storm and, and these 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, we know that at least some of them were established professional fishermen. They should know what a, di what a, a storm is, you know, a, a deadly storm looks like and what it doesn't look like. 
uh, and they were convinced they were in a deadly storm. Teacher, don't you care that we are dying? Jesus was sleeping. Yeah. Verse 39. He awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and said, Peace, be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? How is it that you have no faith? They were greatly afraid and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? A lot more than just a man, I would say. A lot more than just your ordinary common man. Once again, thank you for watching, and uh, may God richly bless you with, uh, with, with deep revelation and, and um, understanding of His Word. And let Him open your eyes to see great and mighty things such as you have never seen before. As you go, be blessed. Thanks for watching.